We're really happy to partner with Happy Raptor tonight. Um, I'm looking forward to this event and making some really great drinks with you guys. So thanks again for joining us. Thank you for coming. We're so excited to be here. And we're excited to sort of see all of you in this <laughs> strange age of digital events, but we're glad that you're here. Um, Happy Raptor is uh, very much a, a work of love. <laughs> Uh, we have, I should mention, we have a third partner, his name is Peter Rivera, he's not here with us tonight, uh, but he's our COO, our co-founder, and um, he's here with us in spirit, he's actually probably just at home. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and we have another little raptor, his name is Zeke, um, Mark and I have a three-year-old son who sort of inspired the name, that's probably our first and most frequently asked question. Um, so Zeke is 34 in December, and he calls this place my raptor. Um, so he's also not here. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to get anything done. Yeah. Um, but no, it's really my background. Uh, before we started Happy Raptor, I uh, had a background in French, actually, originally. <laughs> and then um, communications. I used to work for Bess Gamble, if any of you all know uh, the queen of PR, Bess Gamble. And then Mark's on a really neat professional background. <laughs> so for the last 15 years, I've been working in middle health. So, uh, uh, I am a, a licensed professional counselor and professor at one of the universities here. And I've been, I mean, we got into it, I've been making, I've been making alcohol for about 11 years now, in one form or other. And then about five years ago, Peter, Megan, and I sat down and decided we were gonna, we were gonna try and sell it. <laughs> Yeah, so we're, um, so we, we, yeah, we opened up here after. That was in February of this year, believe it or not, February 14th, um, which is the best and worst time to ever open a business yeah. you've ever heard of. Right during COVID. Right during COVID. The great, right during COVID. great thing about it was that we, we opened for the first day of the Uptown Parade in Marty So we're one block off of St. Charles, as many of you know, we're picking up the boxes. Which is a good place to be here in Mardi Gras, but we only have about five weeks until everything shut down. Yeah. So, and you know, the truth is, getting open was very much um, a community effort. That's my favorite part of the story. Is uh, we passed our final inspection at 8 a.m. the morning of the first Mardi Gras uptown parade, and we opened the door at noon for the very first customers we ever had. And if it had not been for the inspector who rearranged your schedule to get here in time so we could open, and the neighbors who came from all the surrounding blocks to come and support us. Uh, there's just absolutely no way that we would still be in business. And it was just a domino effect from there that gave us the foundation to get through the first couple months of COVID. And then it's just been, you know, one pivot after another, but we're very happy to be here. Um, I'm looking forward to the next morning, Rob. Now that I know y'all are here. I'll be here. Yeah, we're, we mentioned we're right here at the corner of um, Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard. We all know because you picked up your cocktail kit and uh, Condolette Street. And so, yeah, we're just one block from St. Charles Ave. And we have a kind of a primo viewing area for Mardi Gras, which is nice. Mm -hmm. We actually would, um, the, the busiest time for us would be when the parades would get stalled. Yeah, yeah. Because everybody would come and grab a drink and go back. So um, that's what we learned. We learned a lot. This year. <laughs> so I guess we should say, well, first of all, you know, with the conservancy, we're excited to be here because one of the things that is really important for us, we source all of our um, molasses locally. Our run is 100% Louisiana molasses base, and we do source it from sugar fields in Louisiana, sugar cane fields. And so, you know, the importance of the conservancy is, conservancy is that if there are no wetlands, there are no Sugar cane fields, there is no thriving agricultural economy here, which means there's no crop growth. Right. Um, the intersection between all of that and what we do is so extremely important. Uh, so, this is definitely a uh, uh, mission that's very close to our hearts here, and it's a part of our everyday um, in the business. Um, yeah, and that's, that's one thing that we try to do as well is to find these people in the community and businesses in the community that support our mission and we like to partner so that we can sort of jointly get our message across. So we're really excited about this. And I'm really excited about you after. Yeah, us too. <laughs> Thank you. Should we talk about some products? Should we talk about some rum? Yeah. Let's yeah, let's do it. Let's talk about rum. Yeah, let's do it. Awesome. <laughs> so, so we have four.
four products. <laughs> we have four products. You have two of them in the box, but we'll go through all four. So everything, all of our products are based on the silver, the five four silver. So this is after we ferment the molasses, run it through the still a couple of times. This is what comes off the still with a little bit of water added to it, so that you don't, uh, so that it doesn't burn everything going down. <laughs> comes off the still around seventy percent, so we proof it down to about 40, 41 percent before we bottle. So from there, it's we use the silver to make the other three: our gold, our hibiscus. Our the gold, the hibiscus, and the gem star. Sorry. The gold is in, is our silver that's infused on oak, so it it's reminiscent of a barrel aged uh, alcohol spirit. And then the hibiscus and banana floss are our unique. The hibiscus is it we take the silver rum and infuse it with dried hibiscus petals, dehydrated lime. Uh, Cinnamon sticks, vanilla beans, and all spice for five days. Filter it and bottle it. The banana sauce is a little more, uh, a little longer process. So we take the white rum, we we put it on dehydrated banana for about four weeks, then add the vanilla and cinnamon and spices for another two weeks after that before we finish it with a little bit of molasses. And then filter it and And when I say a little bit, the last batch we did, we added about 250 milliliters of molasses for 13 pounds. So it's a very small amount just to add a little bit of flavor. That's quite like the process for that banana monster. It is. It takes about eight to nine weeks total. Wow. Well, yeah. Now, is that typical for the like, flavor type of rum? Just because I don't know anything about production. Well, yeah, actually, it's um, it's sort of just depending on the rum. Okay. For All example, right. and then if you really are a purist like we are, yeah. there's a lot of different elements that come into play. So I'll tell you, our uh, rum is inspired by we create rum based on a Caribbean tradition called a rum apple shake, which just means infused rum. Okay. And in the Caribbean, um, I'll tell you what you do is there's a couple different ways you can uh, buy an infused rum in. Caribbean, especially the French Caribbean, like Martinique, which is where we discovered this technique, which is where they'll take a bottle of white rum just like this, and then they put all of the citrus, botanicals, and spices inside it, and they let it sit on the shelf with all of those flavors. And then they take it home, and they don't even filter it at all. They just go for it. God bless. We filter, um, for sure. We won't, we won't do that to you. Um, but that is uh, kind of in its purest form what we do. Now, one thing that's unique about Happy Raptor compared to other distilleries is we don't climate control our production area. Um, there's a couple different reasons for that. One of them being that we couldn't afford air conditioning. So... <laughs> <laughs> it's already, you already put a lot of money yeah. into renovating the building for the distillery. Well, but all the money is going into the product itself. No, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> so, for example, the 504 hibiscus, which is very much like our little baby flagship, um, favorite so far. Um, the hibiscus in the summer, it can, we can turn it over in 24 hours because it gets so hot, all of the flavors infuse so fast. Mm. But then when it cools down and we're more like we are today, which by the way is when in February when we opened and we were really turning out the product, mm. it would take maybe four, maybe four, four or five days to turn around. Um, so that was a surprise for us this summer when we said, oh gosh, this is really like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so it really just depends, but banana sponsor is unique. The reason it takes, um, oh, and you guys, if you have any questions, like Amy's going to be asking us questions throughout the night, if you have any questions, throw them into the chat for sure. Um, we've got lots of help, and we'll shout out some of the ones that Anton wants to say come in. Yeah. Um, and you can hear us too, let us know. We know this is like a big space and it's kind of echoey. So let us know. Yeah, perfect. Um, yeah, the banana sponsor does take much longer than the others. The reason for that is because banana is uh, temperamental. Yeah, it's banana <laughs> is very difficult to get flavor out of. Yeah, I can imagine that. They are kind of so anyway in their flavor. Yeah. They are, and you know, we should mention today is kind of banana sponsor's like birthday kind yeah. of. Yeah, today is the is the launch of our final recipe. For the banana sauce during So we had a test batch when we first opened 
and and then we were reworking the recipe, and as of today, it's officially on the market. Yay! <laughs> now we're extremely proud, and we'll talk way more about the banana sponsor a little bit later in the program. We're going to make a batch with it, which is going to be a real treat. Um, but first, maybe we should start going to make a drink. Yeah, we're going to need one, right? Let's make one. Right. Um, All right, so. So there are two recipe cards in your boxes. If you haven't searched through yet, you're going to look for the one that is called Sister Soccer Kids. And I'll let Megan give you the background about naming that recipe. Well, Sister Soccer Kids actually, as you guys probably recall, when um, everything in March was when all the bars and restaurants shut down in New Orleans, and then we got to reopen at 25% capacity for like a minute in June. Like it was just maybe a couple weekends that we were open again, right over the 4th of July. And, and so we rolled out this cocktail that we called the Sister Suffragette. I named the cocktail, and I, want, I really deeply want to tell you it's because it's an election year. And everyone needs to go vote. And it's and if you do, all deeply need to remember the importance of voting truthfully. It was the fourth of July, and I love the movie Mary Poppins. <laughs> and it felt like <laughs> and it was a fun and it was silly and reminiscent. And then you know, little kids, you know, as we get closer and closer to election day, we really realize um how you know that was a little probably frivolous at the time. I still love that movie, okay. But um, so the sister suffragette, and then the surprise of it was that it really quickly became one of the best selling cocktails, even just in that couple of weeks that we were open, of all time, ever. And all of these months of cocktail selling. Um, but it doesn't uh, pre batch very well. So when I say pre batch, in our tasting rooms, we've been, um, we've only been allowed to sell to drinks. And we sold them in sealed containers like you might find let's, let's be clear because it's been very contentious even in order to go around. <laughs> we are not okay. allowed, we were not allowed to sell the drinks. We were allowed to sell sealed pre batch uh, cocktails for consumption off prices. Yes, yeah. that's the specific jargon. So is that kind of like if you have a lid on it because it's drawn? No, no, it? these oh, have to be, it has to be sealed. Yeah. These have chamber of any caps so you can see if they fit. And we have we had to sell the equivalent of package, so it's the exactly. same as selling a bottle of uh, exactly three big drinks, put them in the bottles, right. and that way. exactly. And that is the greatest thing ever, in a way. I mean, I mean it, it was one of our most useful and um, fun pivots that we made because it's so great to come in and buy a cocktail ready to go, you throw it in your bag, go to the park, walk around. Um, whatever that's going to be. So it's really become an important benchmark of our business that we had planned on and we're going to keep. Um, but the Sister Suffragette does not really pre batch very well. It's very, there's so many fresh ingredients and the muddling of the lemon and the mint is so important in this drink that you really have to make it either, you know, we'll make it for you in our tasting room or you need to make it at home. You know, yeah. So let's make it. All right. Do it. So what you're going to need for this drink is. The 504 Gold Rum. So you can get the, the eight ounce container. It's got a little sticker on it that says 504 Gold. You're going to need that. You're going to need the raw simple syrup. I've got a big one here, but I, the majority of you have one of these little ones. It's going to say raw simple syrup. The banana muscovado one is for our next cocktail. And then you're going to need the lemons and the mint. So, this is the only cocktail that is on our menu that I will allow to be on our menu right now <laughs> that requires muddling. Because muddling is fine when you're at home making a single cocktail or two and not fine when you have to make 15 of them by 20 minutes. Okay, so first you need to cut the line off. Oh, and then, excuse me. Uh, if you don't have a cocktail shaker, so we're going to start with a cocktail shaker. If you don't have a cocktail shaker, if you have like a pint glass, that works just as well. But if you can put the plastic cup over a pint mm -hmm. glass and use it as a shaker. Uh, just because sometimes we don't have all the things you need. That's a good point. I don't have a shaker. Yeah, if you don't have a shaker, okay. you, get, you get like a regular pint glass, you get like a Mardi Gras cup yeah. or something. Yeah. You just 
Go on top and shake it. Same thing. If you don't have a jitter, then you're going to, uh, you can use a shot glass. You're going to put portions of the ingredients are fine. It doesn't matter if you use one ounce or another. Yeah. 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 Y
And so it's been sort of a point of entry for me. And it's all about like what you have at home too, because it's not like, and how many of us just have simple syrup sitting at home? But if you just keep some white sugar and some raw sugar, it takes two seconds to throw a yeah. cup of water in the microwave, boil it, add the sugar, and then you have a cinnamon. And it keeps in the fridge for a long time. Right. So you can put it in the fridge and you can use it for yeah. all months, really. Yeah. So next we're gonna muddle. So you've got the simple syrup in here with the lemons. Right. Yeah. If you don't have a muddler, uh, use a kitchen utensil that hangs around back. So, like maybe if you have any wooden spoons in the kitchen, mm -hmm. just flip it over and use the end of it. And you're just going to push down and twist. Don't do that. Yeah. Don't stand. You're going to push down and then twist at the bottom. And you just really want to, what it's doing is simple syrup is mixing together with all the goodness and the lemons and the mint and getting all the flavors and the oils out of it. So that once you add the rest of it, it all comes together very nicely. people just join, you want to just tell us what you're making? Great, yeah, we're, um, we're making that sister supper chat. Uh, cocktail in your box. So far, we put together the raw simple syrup, um, a couple of the lemon, about a quarter of the lemon, about a quarter of the lemon, and about what do we say, eight, eight to nine, nine leaves of mint. Okay. Now, when you're going back, one one note, as most of you will notice, the mint that you got from us is huge. Look at this mint leaf. That's ridiculous. <laughs> Nobody gets mint leaf like that at the grocery store. It's because we got it from Restaurant Depot, and so the mint you get there is giant, and they give you like two pounds of it. Uh, so if you're buying mint at the store, you might need to use more than eight or nine leaves if they give you the mint with those eight big leaves. So we muddled it all together. Yeah, so we added those up, muddled it all together, and now we're adding the lot. All right, so for a lot of our drinks, the uh, the ratio that we use is two to one. So it's two ounces of, or two parts, rum to one part syrup. So we use one ounce of simple syrup in here, we're gonna put two ounces of the gold rum. Make sure you use the gold rum. If you added an ounce of in here with a lemon in the neck, I take no responsibility for that. Uh, all right, it doesn't actually matter whether you use the gold that's in the big or the little one, uh, follow that. You've got about 12 ounces total. All right. If you use a shot glass for the uh, the simple syrup, then you just use that same shot glass and do two of them for the wrong. That way you keep your proportions the same. Yeah. So how do you develop drinks in general? You know, we um we come up, we look, we do research, and we'll kind of play around ourselves. We make a lot of drinks at home, yeah, just for fun and see if they work. We'll test them in the tasting room, and if they're really popular, we'll keep them on the menu. But truly, the number one way that we will develop a new drink and really keep it around is through um, our guests. Yeah. They'll come in and then say, "Hey, have you tried this? I tried to make this at home. It was so good. Y'all should put it at your bar." That's valuable to us. We have a mojito that we make with our hibiscus. Um, that is because specifically, I guess we're just making it themselves. And there were so many people saying that they had tried it at home right. that we just put on the menu. Nice. This this cocktail specifically comes from the fact that a lot of people that have tried that are big bourbon fans that try that gold rum really enjoy it and say it reminds them of bourbons. Mm -hmm. And so. When we were trying to come up with some new cocktails, I went and looked for bourbon whiskey. And this is an alteration of a, a, a whiskey smash, which is just bourbon and lemon and uh, and mint. All right, so yes, this is my regular job. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna put this in here. All right, so you're gonna fill the cocktail shaker up now with ice. 
and then you're going to shake it. So if you're using the um, if you're using the pint glass and plastic cup method, make sure that you get a seal on it because if it's not the right size and it does not seal, it's going to be very messy. So maybe practice in the kitchen. Or yeah, so maybe do this somewhere that's not going to stick. <laughs> uh, all right. And then shake. And so in general, I shake it until the outside of the the cocktail shaker starts to frost, which means I have to peel a hand off of it, but then you know it's nice and cold. So it should come out a light yellow color with little bits of green from the mint where it's shredded while you're shaking. Thank you. You're welcome. This is my favorite cocktail that we serve. So yeah, I'm really looking see. forward to coming back. I don't know if y'all can it. see. Cheers. Cheers. I don't know if y'all can see the, the color. Cheers, the color everybody. Cheers, you guys. Um, 
First question is, does rum naturally have more sugar than vodka? Um, so that's the question. We're going to let you guys kind of, that's whole question number, is it number one for us? I number two. It's number two. Number two. Number two. Thank you. Um, and while y'all are answering, um, I'll tell you a couple little fun facts. One is that our uh, rum is all 100% gluten-free. Um, it's celiac friendly, I should say. And obviously, if you're celiac, you should always consult your doctor before, um, or you know your own body before you um, choose anything. But we do take that very seriously. I'm gluten sensitive, so that's important to us. And diabetic friendly, we really work hard to reduce um, any unnecessary additives and ingredients that includes a lot of added sugar that gets added to rum a lot. Um, so we try to keep it, you know, a safer choice. If we have any added, then we keep it from that. Yeah, exactly. In fact, the only one that has it in it right now is the banana saucer with that molasses. Otherwise, there's no sugar. All right. So you want the you want the yeah, the plate for the answer? All right. So we have. We have the majority of people saying, yes, rum has higher sugar content than vodka. And one person said that sometimes, depending on the variety of molasses used. Yeah. He's going to pick it apart. So, uh, so with, when we're talking about white rum or any kind of white, any kind of unaged spirit, it all has the same amount of sugar and the same amount of calories, and it's based on the percent alcohol that it has. So something that's 50% alcohol or 100 proof has more sugar and calories in it than something that's 40% or 80 proof. But there's no solids that go across during the distillation process, so there's no sugars that make it. So the fact that it starts with sugar doesn't, none of that sugar that's left that isn't turned into alcohol carries over. So all alcohol, whether it's tequila, vodka, rum, whiskey, has the same amount of calories and sugar if it's white and unaged and nothing's been added to it. So technically the correct answer is A. So nobody got that right. <laughs> everybody I mean, everybody feels like rum has more sugar because it tastes sweet. But that's the best news we give people. Yeah. Um, our number one customer actually is female, which I'm very, very proud of. Women do lead um, the spirits market, which people don't realize, and we never get the credit we deserve. Um, but because uh, so over 70% of our customer base is female. So um, whenever I drop that bit of knowledge, yeah, it's always great. Yeah. You're actually saying rum is a diet drink. That's right. It's a good diet. I mean, look, great white rum. <laughs> so, um, I think we've got a little video. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, so now we've got a little video for you guys. This was actually made by our fetal biologist at Women's Conservancy, Todd Benkart. Uh, so, we'll get that uh, geared up for you guys. And let us know during the video if you have any questions. Feel free to chat them over and then we can answer them after the video. Woodlands Conservancy was established as a nonprofit land trust in 2001 with a vision to be the regional model for the conservation of hardwood forests and a leader in the advocacy and preservation of Louisiana's coastal forest ecosystems. Located in the greater New Orleans area, Woodlands Conservancy actively works to restore and protect over 800 acres of forested wetlands. Today, the lands managed by Woodlands Conservancies are clad in oak, cypress, and ash trees. Fields of blackberries, passion fruit, and wetland areas create habitats for a large diversity of species. This is where we target our resources and efforts. Acre by acre, we protect and restore jigsaw puzzle pieces of habitat to maintain Louisiana's natural treasures for the enjoyment of future generations. Louisiana has lost 75% of its pre-settlement forested wetlands to development. The few remaining forested wetland areas serve a vital function as a natural sponge to absorb the stormwater, mitigate storm surges, and act as a windbreak to protect the surrounding community during major storm events. The immeasurable value of this ecosystem, not only as a habitat for declining wildlife species and as a hurricane storm buffer, but as a recreational outlet for the community, make it imperative that we continue our efforts to preserve, restore, and enhance Louisiana's forested wetlands. We believe that by engaging the community, offering public opportunities for recreation, ecotourism, and education in a natural setting lays a foundation for a sustainable conservation for the future. 
The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service reports that with continuing wetland loss and relative sea level rise, the lands managed by Woodlands Conservancy will be one of the largest forested land masses between open water and the city of New Orleans within the next 35 to 50 years. All right, guys, thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed that little video. Um, next, we have another poll question for you. And um, as you learned in the video, um, on this conservancy, um, the land is really important to our migratory birds. So we're going to do poll question three. Um, and the question is, um, oh, yeah, OK, so really quick before I, before I take the question, um, the land at Wilderness Conservancy actually serves as kind of like a fattening up station for birds and it's for, for uh, before and after they travel from to, to and from the Gulf of Mexico. Um, so this land is really important to them. Um, so the, there is data from the U.S. Geological Society um, that shows uh, the number of migratory birds that live off from a given area and they do this by using infrared. So they actually did this at Wilderness Conservancy at our 840 acres. So our question finally is, um, how many birds do you think that they saw lifting off from Wilderness Conservancy in one night during peak migration? So our possible answers are A, 44, B, 400, or C, 4,400. And go ahead and put your answers in and hit submit. Um, and really quick, while you're answering the question, um, I had a hard time picking poll questions because there's just so many interesting facts about Woodlands Conservancy. Um, so I learned that um, the most abundant migratory bird that we actually have is the white-eyed vireo. Um, so you can look that up later on Google, but they're actually really, really pretty. Um, and then the most abundant bird that we see that is not migratory, that's just a resident bird, is the northern cardinal, which you probably see in the yards all the time. So we, we do have tons of those at Woodlands. Um, so we're hoping that over time, we'll see more and more birds with all the restoration work that we're doing. So, okay, let's see if we got some answers in. We do. It's tied between uh, B and C. So B, 400, okay. C, 4,400. Okay, so it was tied between B and C. And the answer actually is C, which is amazing. They saw 4,400 birds coming out of the conservancy in just one night. So we're really proud of all the work we can do to that's pretty cool. Yeah, for all these birds. So just think of that, you know, times the number of days, and that's just a lot of birds. There's millions of birds that you lose in the fly away. So that's why this work is so important. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. Um, and as we transition into a little video that Happy Raptor made, I did want to mention one thing, and that is a very special happy birthday to Nancy. Her daughter can have picked up a bunch of boxes for all her family and friends to join us tonight and make cocktails just for her birthday. So they're so excited and happy birthday! <laughs> and then yeah, transitioning right into um into our little video that we made. Um, you know, we talked a little bit earlier about how important the wetlands are um, to just making sure that our coastline is intact and our agricultural economy is strong. And uh, so one of the things that Happy Raptor does is we do actually travel to uh, a little, little town outside of Donaldsonville, Louisiana. We go to Bell Rose, about an hour and a half away, and to we, pick up our waters. Yeah, we do. We pick it up there right from the field. And so we just went last week and picked up some new molasses. So we thought we would document that drink for you a little bit. Okay. Going to the sugar mill.
this molasses back to the trailer is a really long and boring process. Because it smells. 
Because I looked at it and it was dark and looked kind of wet, and you could tell it had all kinds of glasses in it, and I was like, I'm going to buy that and make something with it. Mark, one, one. Check and I told them about the OK fit in South America. Sure. Mark puts one stick of a very rare type of oak in the five four gold yeah. only because it smells really good. It smells delicious. <laughs> it is a Brazilian, it's a Brazilian tree called Amarana, which we found at um, we found a place that supplies imported wood that was untreated. I toasted it myself. And I put one stick of it in every one of the batches while they ate it. For good luck, really. <laughs> and because it adds a little spice flavor to it. Alright, so you're taking the bitter simple syrup. And or y'all might be ahead of me. Alright, so now we have our rums and our simple syrup in there. You can yes. just switch it around. Or if you have um, if you have a spoon, you can stir it. I mean, look, there's not that much in there, so you don't necessarily need to stir, you can just swish. All right. So you don't want to fill the glass up with ice because then you've got all this ice and that much drink. So. Okay, I'm going to see you. It's just a little bit. Yeah. So usually with the uh, old fashioned, I'll fill it up about halfway. It doesn't have to be that much. It depends on how fast you drink and how watered down you are. So after you add the ice, I'll usually switch around again or stir again just for a second. It helps melt some of the ice. And the thing about this drink is it is straight rum with a little bit of bitterness and a little bit of sugar and very little mixer. It's really strong. Can you use any bitters? You can use any bitters, but I would test it before making cold drinks with it because like making just switching it out can be dangerous because aromatic bitters, even though they can be called just aromatic bitters across the board, do not taste exactly the same. Mm -hmm. So I like, we use Angostura as the base one, but I have about 15 different types of bitters here and we'll play around with different ones in different cocktails, but it's really the taste. Mm -hmm. So you've got to see if you're going to change the bitters, whether you like those. Uh, so, so by, because there's not a lot that's diluting the rum in this drink, by letting the ice melt a little bit, it really kind of mellows it. And then you can, you know, unless you like it really strong and don't put much ice, and just go for it. Okay. Old fashions in our tasting room is the only drink people get a little mean about. Yeah, people really, get very territorial in a very certain way. Yeah. Can we talk about how beautiful it is? Because they're a little fashion. Oh my god, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. The most beautiful glasses. Yeah. Speaking of these glasses, these are our Woodlands Conservancy glasses that were made by Mignon Faget. And they say Woodlands Conservancy, and they have our little Karen on them. And we actually can sell them if you're interested. They have, we have them on our website. So I bought some too. I do too. All of them. <laughs> <laughs> cool. right. Cheers. 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 Cheers, everyone at home. Cheers, y'all. All right, let's do the last raffle. Um, great, so the last raffle item, I think you guys could have foreseen this, it is going to be um, one free bottle of our 504 Banana Slash Rum, the star of the day. Um, yay. <laughs> our brand new Pride and Joy. So let's do this one. I guess. Yeah, I don't want people to hate me if I don't pick any points in a row. <laughs> oh, okay, some people have two tickets. Oh, they're lucky day. <laughs> I've never won a raffle in ever. Yeah, we don't want to win. Yeah, it's very rare for you to. Terry Tannenbaum! Terry! Alright, so Terry will send you an email and you can come and grab your bottle. Shoot over any last questions that you guys may have too. Um, okay, okay, we got the fourth poll and you can get your head there. 
Oh, great. Okay, so um, a happy rafter. We uh, community involvement and uh, give back is extremely important to us. That's for all kinds of reasons. Um, it's very much the core of our business. But one of the most important things that kept us alive was the production of hand sanitizer. So our question um, is, hang on, I gotta find it. Oh, how much hand sanitizer has been donated by Louisiana distillers collectively during the coronavirus shutdown? Question number five. That's question number five. So, and while you're assembling your answers, your guesses, um, one thing that we can tell you, well, I'll give you a hint, um, although, I don't know if it's much of a hint. A happy rafter, we donated to date almost $5,000 worth of hand sanitizer. Wow. Um, yeah, we're very proud of that, wow. especially since we're brand new and we're so small. Um, thank you. That was really great. <laughs> Actually, and that being said, if any of you know, so so right now we are basically any school or nonprofit that is looking for hand sanitizer, we are donating at least three gallons. So yeah, we're still if you know of organizations that need it, uh, let us know. Call yeah. us. We have them call us. And many of the distilleries in Louisiana um, are sitting on a lot more hand sanitizer than we are. How they choose to donate it is their choice. We try to say yes to every single request, um, even if it's just a little bit. But there, if you know, especially teachers, um, the majority of our uh, hand sanitizer more recently has been donated underprivileged schools. They obviously were the greatest in need um, more recently. Uh, so if you know anybody, it, it's absolutely still out there. It's absolutely still available. Feel free to start with us and help you out. It looks like um, everyone thinks 70,000 A was the top answer. That's the correct answer. Yeah. Yay. Yay. And that was, that number I'm certain has gone up. That was probably a month ago that tacky. So I'm sure you just added my time to it. That's right. <laughs> I mean, the okay. last poll. We have one last poll question for you guys. Um, and this one is about trees. And this is number six. Um, so one of the things that we do at Woodlands for restoration work, um, we do several things. One of the things that we do is uh, plant native trees. So first we have to go in and we have to remove invasive species from, uh, from the land. Um, and then we plant trees. Um, so our question for you is, how many trees does Woodlands Conservancy plant annually? And our answers are there. They are 500, 1,000, or 2,000. So go ahead and shoot us your answers whenever you get a second. Um, it looks like it's overwhelmingly. Oh, it's like it's overwhelmingly. C. C. Yeah, well, that one's too easy. <laughs> so uh, since we've been established um, in 2001, we've actually planted um, over 16,000 trees. Um, and I just want to say that that's because of you, because of you all watching. Um, you supporting this tonight um, and coming to this, um, you're helping us do this. So thank you so much. Um, we need you and the wetlands need you. Um, so we actually have some upcoming events, which um, I think Happy Raptor has some to share, and, and so do we. So we'd love to um, tell you about them. So uh, really quick, let me get ours here. Uh, we're currently doing a, a hackathon, if you guys are interested in joining. Um, it's going on right now through December 31st. You can sign up on our website. Um, I signed up. It's really fun. You can actually go to Woodlands and hike our trails. We have 10 miles of trails. Um, it's all free to come and walk. Um, so please join us for that. Um, we also have a bird watching hike, which is next Thursday, the 29th, uh, with Dr. Craig Hood. Um, these hikes are actually really, really fun. Um, they're socially distant. Um, you wear masks and everything. Um, so I highly recommend. Um, and then after that, we have a winter bird hike on November 14th with um, Dr. Peter Yuki. Um, so please join us for that as well. We'll see you there. I want to do that bird hike. Yeah, it's actually, it sounds really oh, good. Actually, it's really, really fun. Yeah. yeah. For Mother's Day, I asked for a set of binoculars for my husband, and I use them like all the time. Even out my window. I'm like, it's a girl. So we should be seeing us in those hikes. Um, yeah, so and Happy Raptor this weekend, we're really going to be celebrating the Nance Foster launch. We're really excited we have um, to celebrate the launch. Um, besides the big main event, which we just are about to wrap up. Thank you all so much. Uh, we are partnering with some other really cool um, pop ups, and we've done some collabs with some other really kind of neat niche food companies in, in town. Um, so Friday and Saturday, we're going to be joined by Violet Sprinkles. Um, they, that's a, it's a specialty macaron 
artist that's with French macarons, and she does really cool fun shapes. Um, oh yeah, we have an example. Um, she does like some cool Star Wars stuff. She's gonna bring out a whole bunch of Halloween themes, and then she does the most delicious, incredible banana sausage flavor. So we have we have a banana sausage. She's making a banana sausage flavor macaron with little raptor traps on it. So you us. and she has a a brulee banana, a slice of brulee banana in the middle of the macaron. Wow, that is crazy. I like that. She goes to what else is right now to say. <laughs> and uh, we have a, a Honduran gourmet popsicle mm. company called Quinones de la Abuela um, that is coming in and we are doing a, it sounds crazy, but you guys, there's nothing more delicious on the planet you haven't lived until you've tried this. Um, Quinones de um, we have different varieties like the coconut, for example, and we're doing a rum pairing with them. So uh, and he made one. He made a rum raisin where he soaks the raisins in our silver rum for a couple of days before he puts it in. And then puts it. So that's our like collab item. So for example, the coconut uh, flavor with a shot of the five hundred four banana sponsor, it's pure heaven. And um, so we're thrilled about that. And then Saturday we have Bugs Burgers coming. It's our first official food pop up in the space because we haven't been open to have any. So we're thrilled. And he makes these big, delicious, juicy burgers and fries. And um, our patio is open. Um, we have a beautiful patio in the back, and we'll have seating on the sidewalk. Um, if we're busy, you can always grab an order to go. Um, and so, and then we have some other stuff coming on more food pop ups. and. Uh, we have a big promo for election day for sure. If you voted, we'll uh, give you a free hibiscus lemonade. Free eight ounce hibiscus lemonade. Yeah, and you get a cute sticker because I voted. Um, so yeah, you can find more information at happyrocker.com or you can follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Philo for Rum. Um, and so that's we keep that updated with all the happenings. Yeah, just two additional questions. Like oh, you. great, yeah. Uh, one is how do you make the banana simple syrup? Oh, so how do you make the banana simple syrup? Actually, it might be on the recipe card. Mm -hmm. Is it not? Uh -huh. um, regardless, if, it, if you can also email us if it's not on there to give you a reminder. But okay. so um, it's not on the recipe card. So the banana must provide a simple syrup. So one of the things that we get is we. Found a natural banana extract so that I don't have to use. So it's a little difficult to find. You have to go online and look for it because they don't have it in stores. It's all the imitation banana flavors. And so we have a pure natural banana extract that we use in the simple syrup. And then uh, I buy a 16 ounce muscovado sugar. And it's one part, it's, it's 16 ounces of the sugar, 16 ounces of water with just about a teaspoon of the pure banana extracts. If you go to happyrocker.com, you'll notice a tab that says some notes and recipes. And we do, I know for sure, have the recipes for the raw simple syrup and the banana muscovado simple syrup on there under the, um, like under the old fabulous by the four banana sauce for old fashioned recipe, you'll find it right there. Perfect. And one more question yeah. is, what, what drinks do you use the hibiscus from for? So the hibiscus is actually way easier to use in drinks than the banana sauce there. Because the hibiscus is really versatile with citrus and other things. So the rum punch that I make, we use the, the hibiscus as well as the silver and the gold. You can make a traditional daiquiri with the hibiscus rum, and that's really easy. It's two parts rum, one part simple syrup, one part lime juice. You put that in a cocktail shaker and shake it, and you have a traditional daiquiri. You add mint to the cocktail shaker and shake it, and oh, you have a <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, What else? We, you can we mix the right grenadine. Oh, yeah. For the dirty Shirley, that's a really easy one. Yeah. That one's magic, and it's very strong. Yeah, it's so strong. Like it that one you have to like sweeter because it's right in the grenadine. It's, yeah, it's pretty like sweet. Yeah. But the, the cocktail, the easiest cocktail for the hibiscus. And that the most popular, the best selling one we've had is the one that we uh, that we gave the samples of is the hibiscus lemonade, which is literally two ingredients: is lemonade and hibiscus rum. And uh, if you want to replicate it at home, we'll buy a gallon of Milo's lemonade and get a bottle of hibiscus. 
And mix it. And mix it. Just put a whole bottle in there. It's one bottle of hibiscus lemonade to, or hibiscus rum for one gallon of lemonade. I think yeah. they wanted to know if it was pre mixed in their pack. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yes, yes. that's the one that's pre mixed in pack. Exactly. And the, um, if you really want to get a little fancy, you can add a little um, sparkling water with it. We like to add a little koi in the tasting room for a sparkling hibiscus lemonade. Um, we keep key lime in the koi. Um, but actually, the lemon, the lime, yeah. any, any sparkling water that you like, it works really well. I mean, if you go, we have a bunch of recipes on our website, we add them all the time. The um, thing I should mention too about bananas foster, if you're thinking about recipes there, any seasonal drink, um, you can even throw it in a shot of coffee. Yeah, like any on a winter, Saturday morning. Any winter drink. Any winter any, drink. Any like, hot drink or work I mean, not tea. Not tea. Egg not. I don't know that I put it in like black tea. But <laughs> coffee, hot chocolate, eggnog, horchata. Oh, eggnog. Yeah, you could do yeah. all this yeah. on eggnog. Mm -hmm. so it's a perfect like, time for that. We're starting to experiment with it and baking a little bit, maybe throw it in a bread pudding. Um, and then there are some, especially some of the tiki cocktails, um, where it really lends itself nicely to um, some of those flavors. And um, yeah, so you know, we're still playing with it. If y'all come across any recipes that you love with the bananas foster, Please do. Well, they have to put on the menu. Yes, we really do use that feedback. <laughs> All right, y'all, let's toast. Thank you. Oh, yeah, thank, thank, you. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you so thank much. You very much. Really, really, really so much. Cheers, Cheers to all of you. And thank, thank you. you. Have yes. a great nice evening. And come see us. We're yeah. reopening. We're going to have tours. And we can't wait. <laughs> all right. Bye.